Frankenstein, Chapter 13 I now hasten to the more moving part of my story. I shall relate events that impressed me with feelings which, from what I had been, have made me what I am. Spring advanced rapidly. The weather became fine and the skies cloudless. It surprised me that what before was desert and gloomy should now bloom with the most beautiful flowers and verdure. My senses were gratified and refreshed by a thousand scents of delight and a thousand sights of beauty. It was on one of these days when my cottagers periodically rested from labour. The old man played on his guitar and the children listened to him. That I observed the countenance of Felix was melancholy beyond expression. He sighed frequently, and once his father paused in the music, and I conjectured by his manner that he inquired the cause of his son's sorrow. Felix replied in a cheerful accent, and the old man was recommencing his music when someone tapped at the door. It was a lady on horseback, accompanied by a countryman as a guide. The lady was dressed in a dark suit and covered with a thick black veil. Agatha asked a question, to which the stranger's only reply was by pronouncing in a sweet accent the name of Felix. Her voice was musical but unlike that of either of my friends. On hearing this word Felix came up hastily to the lady, who, when she saw him, threw up her veil, and beheld a countenance of angelic beauty and expression her hair of a shining raven black, and curiosity braided. Her eyes were dark, but gentle, although animated, her features of a regular proportion, and her complexion wondrously fair, each cheek tinged with a lovely pink. Felix seemed ravished with delight when he saw her. Every trait of sorrow vanished from his face and it instantly expressed a degree of ecstatic joy of which I could hardly have believed it capable. His eyes sparkled and his cheek flushed with pleasure, and at that moment I thought him as beautiful as the stranger. She appeared affected by different things. Wiping a few tears from her lovely eyes, she held out a hand to Felix who kissed it rapturously and called her as well as I could distinguish his sweet Arabian. She did not appear to understand him, but smiled. He assisted her to dismount, and, dismissing her guide, conducted her to the cottage. Some conversation took place between him and his father, and the young stranger knelt at the old man's feet and would have kissed his hand, but he raised her and embraced her affectionately. I soon perceived that although the stranger uttered articulate sounds and appeared to have a language of her own, she was neither understood by nor herself understood the cottagers. They made many signs which I did not comprehend, but I saw her presence diffused gladness through the cottage, dispelling their sorrows as the sun dissipates the morning mists. Felix seemed particularly happy with the smiles of delight welcoming his Arabian. Agatha, the ever-gentle Agatha, kissed the hands of the lovely stranger and pointed to her brother, made signs which appeared to me to mean that he had been sorrowful until she came. Some hours passed thus, while they, by their countenance, expressed joy, the cause of which I could not comprehend. Presently, I found by the frequent recurrence of some sound which the stranger repeated after them, that she was endeavouring to learn the language, and the idea instantly occurred to me that I should make use of the same instructions to the same end. The stranger learned about twenty words at the first lesson. Most of them, indeed, were those which I had before understood, but I profited by the others. As night came on, Agatha and the Arabian retired early. When they separated, Felix kissed the hand of the stranger and said, Good night, sweet Safi. 
He sat up much longer conversing with his father by the frequent repetition of her name. I conjectured that their lovely guest was the subject of their conversation. I ardently desired to understand them, and bent every faculty towards that purpose, but I found it utterly impossible. The next morning Felix went out to his work, and after the usual occupations of Agatha were finished, the Arabian sat at the feet of the old man, and taking his guitar, played some airs so in Chancingly beautiful, that they at once drew tears of sorrow and delight from my eyes. She sang, and her voice flowed with a rich cadence, swelling or dying away like a nightingale of the woods. When she had finished, she gave the guitar to Agatha, who at first declined it. She played a simple air, and her voice accompanied it in sweet accents but unlike the wondrous strain of the stranger. The old man appeared enraptured and said some words which Agatha endeavoured to explain to Safi, but by which he appeared to wish to express that she bestowed on him the greatest delight by her music. The days now passed as peacefully as before, with the sole alteration that joy had taken place of sadness in the countenance of my friends. Safi was always gay and happy. She and I improved rapidly in the knowledge of language, so that in two months I began to comprehend most of the words uttered by my protectors. In the meanwhile, also the black ground was covered with herbage, and the green banks interspersed with innumerable flowers, sweet to the sense and the eyes, stars of pale radiance among the moonlit woods. The sun became warmer, the nights clearer and balmy, and my nocturnal rambles were of extreme pleasure to me, although they were considerably shortened by the late setting and the early rising of the sun, for I never ventured abroad during daylight, fearful of meeting with the same treatment I had formerly endured in the first village which I entered. My days were spent in close attention, that I might more speedily master the language, and I may boast that I improved more rapidly than the Arabian, who understood very little and conversed in broken accents, while I comprehended and could imitate almost every word that was spoken. While I improved in speech, I also learned the science of letters, as it was taught to the stranger, and this opened before me a wide field for wonder and delight. The book from which Felix instructed Safi was Volney's Ruins of the Empire. I should not have understood the purport of this book had it not been for Felix, in reading it, given very minute explanations. He had chosen this work, he said, because the declamatory style was framed in imitation of the Eastern authors. Through this work I obtained a a cursory knowledge of history, and a view of the several empires at present existing in the world. It gave me an insight into the manners, governments, and religions of different nations on the earth. I heard of the slothful Asiatics, and the stupendous genius and mental activity of the Grecians of the wars and wonderful virtues of the early Romans, of their subsequent degenerating, of the decline of that mighty empire, of chivalry, Christianity, and kings. I heard of the discovery of the American hemisphere, and wept with Safi over the hapless fate of its original inhabitants. These wonderful narrations inspired me with strange feelings, was man, indeed, at once so powerful, so virtuous and magnificent, yet so vicious and base? He appeared at one time a mere scion of the evil principle, and at another as all that can be conceived of noble and godlike. To be a great and virtuous man appeared the highest honour that can befall a sensitive being. To be base and vicious as many on record have been, appeared the lowest degradation, 
a condition more abject than that of the blind mole or harmless worm. For a long time I could not conceive how one man could go forth to murder his fellow, or even why there were laws and governments. But when I heard the details of vice and bloodshed, my wonder ceased and I turned away with disgust and loathing. Every conversation of the cottagers now opened new wonders to me, while I listened to the instructions which Felix bestowed upon the Arabian, the strange system of human society was explained to me. I heard of the division of property, of immense wealth and squalid poverty, of rank, descent and noble blood. The words induced me to turn towards myself. I learned that the possessions most esteemed by your fellow creatures were high and unsullied descent united with riches. A man might be respected with only one of these advantages, but without either was considered, except in very rare instances, as a vagabond and a slave, doomed to waste his powers for the profit of the chosen few. And what was I? Of my creation and creator I was absolutely ignorant, but I knew that I possessed no money, no friends, no kind of property. I was, besides, endued with a figure hideously deformed and loathsome. I was not even of the same nature as man. I was more agile than they, and could subsist upon coarser diet. I bore the extremes of heat and cold with less injury to my frame. My stature far exceeded theirs. When I looked around, I saw and heard of none like me. Was I, then, a monster, a blot upon the earth, from which all men fled, and whom all men disowned? I cannot describe to you the agony that these reflections inflicted upon me. I tried to dispel them, but sorrow only increased with knowledge. Oh, that I had for ever remained in my native wood, nor known, nor felt beyond the sensations of hunger, thirst and heat. Of what a strange nature is knowledge! It clings to the mind when it has once seized on it, like a lichen on a rock. I wished sometimes to shake off all thought and feeling, but I learned that there was but one means to overcome the sensation of pain, and that was death, a state which I feared yet did not understand. I admired virtue and good feelings, and loved the gentle manners and amiable qualities of my cottagers, but I was shut out from intercourse with them, except through means which I obtained by stealth when I was unseen and unknown, and which rather increased than satisfied the desire I had of becoming one among my fellows. The gentle words of Agatha, the animated smiles of the charming Arabian, were not for me. The mild exhortations of the old man and the lively conversation of the loved Felix were not for me. Miserable, unhappy wretch! Other lessons were impressed upon me even more deeply. I had heard of the difference of sexes, the birth and growth of children, how the father doted on the smiles of the infant and the lively sallies of the older child, how all the life and cares of the mother were wrapped up in the precious charge, how the mind of youth expanded and gained knowledge, of brother, sister, and all the various relationships which bind one human being to another in mutual bonds. But where were my friends and relations? No father had watched my infant days, no mother had blessed me with smiles and caresses, or if they had, all my past life was now a blot, a blind vacancy in which I distinguished nothing. From my earliest remembrance I had, as I then was, in height and proportion. I had never yet seen a being resemble me, or who claimed any intercourse with me. What was I then? The question again reoccurred, to be answered only with groans. 
I will soon explain to what these feelings tended, but allow me now to return to the cottagers, whose story excited in me such various feelings of indignation, delight and wonder, but which all terminated in additional love and reverence for my protectors. For so I loved, in an innocent, half-painful, half-self-deceit to call them.